welcome everyone to Wednesday night satsang. We have arrived here together in this holy moment for a sacred purpose. So I just invite you, if it feels comfortable for you, to go ahead and close down your eyes. Perhaps just lower your gaze. Arrange your body in a way that feels comfortable and supportive for you. And let's just breathe. Breathe into the knowingness that there is nowhere else you need to be, nothing else for you to do except be here now. Hmm. And as we breathe into that, I invite you to center your attention in your heart space. Just see if you can lean into that space and open it just a little bit wider. Yeah, that's it. How about a little wider still? Just breathe into your beautiful heart space. And it is in this space with open hearts that we become receptive to the teachings, to the messages, to the insights, to the healings, to what spirit wants to reveal through you and as you here tonight. And the beautiful thing is that we get to do it in community. And so with our beautiful hearts open and our spirit receptive, we express our deepest gratitude for the opportunity to be here tonight. And we say thank you and so it is, amen. Amen. Thank you, Stacy. While Reverend Jean Marie and Reverend Karen are in at Unity Village in Kansas City, I celebrate that we have tonight uh, Reverend Shirley and ministerial student Stacy here with the speaking parts. And we also have singing with us tonight Todd Silva and Jessica Neese. How sweet is that? So I encourage you to sing with us as you're inspired, knowing, of course, that God hears all prayers, sung and unsung, spoken and unspoken. But as you're moved to join us, feel free. Oh, let this great power. Oh, let this great power wash through, wash through. Oh, let this great power I don't have to wonder what to say or what to do. Just let this great power wash through, wash through. Oh, let me see the American chant, or at least the t text is, Ricky Byers wrote this song, but it means praise the Spirit, and we get to sing Oyahea, 
Occasionally I'm asked, well, are we supposed to sing with the call or the response? And the answer is either or both or neither. You just choose where to sing because God loves all of us. I am listening, I am listening to, the music to the music of the Holy, of the Holy, Holy, Spirit. Holy Spirit. Oh, what a song. Oh, what a song. God is singing. God is singing. I will listen, I will listen all, day long. all day long. I will listen. to enter into our time of meditation so closing your eyes or unfocusing your gaze maybe feeling your feet on the floor becoming aware of the breath maybe taking deeper breaths than you were before we breathe all day 
But when we become aware of the breath and consciously welcome that breath into the body and then release, we can become even more present right here, right now. So I invite you to scan your body and remember the wholeness, thanking all these different systems that are working together. And you might just think to yourself, I am grateful. Grateful to have the healthy skin, blood flowing, muscles, bones, all the systems of the body working together, often without us even thinking about it. So we invite every cell of the body to feel healthy, to feel wholesome, to feel nurtured. Every cell of the body to be working in harmony together, creating this community that we call ourselves. And as we are present and thankful for these bodily vessels that carry us through the world, that help us experience this world. We know also that we are not limited by this physical presence. And so we welcome the harmony, the balance, the unification. And you might even just imagine anything that feels fragmented or splintered, calling it home, calling home different pieces, maybe different identities, different roles that you play in life. different names that you're known by. Imagining any different little fragments or pieces returning into place, clicking into place, knitting together into the whole being that you call you aware that you are connected and supported by the source of all that is, the infinite, the eternal, always abundant, always available, always flowing forth. Always ready to meet any need, to listen, to be aware, to respond and as we know that we are wholesome unified fulfilled we allow love and compassion to emerge through these beings that we are so that we connect across time and place we are not limited by this physical form. We connect with other beings, other minds, on a wavelength of love and compassion, on a wavelength of wholeness and healing, on a wavelength of transformation.
allowing joy to emerge from this knowing, from this oneness, from this connection with the divine source. And as we breathe, we might imagine light entering every cell of our body. Light entering into this room. Light entering into this community. Light entering into all of our relationships, all of our connections, all of our groups our organizations, light entering into everyone around the world, seeing all beings fulfilled, gaining awareness, saying yes to their callings. Connecting energetically. Creating a space of love. Creating a space of joy and compassion. Creating a space of freedom where we let loose anything that feels heavy, any baggage that we no longer need to carry, we can set it down. releasing any heaviness, envisioning bright, joyful, loving space where we connect, where we use all of our gifts and skills and resources, where we say yes to our callings, where we say yes to becoming the most fulfilled human beings that we can possibly be in these lifetimes. As we breathe and feel grounded in the space, we know that we are one, that we are connected with the one infinite, eternal source That is all, all is one and all is well, no matter what outward circumstances may say, we can feel unified, welcoming the wholeness that we are. And so we appreciate the foundations that we build on. We appreciate the people who have come before. We appreciate the doors that have been opened, the learning, the wisdom, the resources. We appreciate who we are. We appreciate being supported and nurtured and nourished. We appreciate what is ours to do, the clarity of knowing how to call forth our, the fullness of who we are, saying yes. And we appreciate the connection, the oneness of the divine eternal. So as we return and are aware of our physical bodies, grateful for the consciousness that is carried in this space. You might move your shoulders, your hands, your neck, calling forth the fullness of who you are into right here, right now. And we are grateful for this music and this time together. And so it is. Amen.
So as Rev Shirley said, we come into this moment knowing the fullness of who we are. And who we are is our self-expressions of the divine, fully abundant in every way. Evidence from everything from the air that we breathe to the leaves on the trees outside of this pyramid at Unity of Houston. And so we give of our gifts in many ways. And here we have an opportunity to give of our gifts, our financial gifts, either here in the pyramid tonight or for our online viewers, you can text to give or go on our website. And so we give from the knowing that we live in an abundant universe and that we like to give to things that we want to see more of in the world. When you give to Unity of Houston, you're saying, yes, yes, I love this work that Unity is doing in the world and I want to be a part of it. And so we are grateful for that. And so together, let's speak our offertory blessing. Divine love through me blesses and multiplies all the good I am and have, all the good I give and receive. Amen. There is just one mind That mind is God's mind That mind is perfect That mind is my mind now Right now There is just one life that life is God's life. That life is perfect. That life is my life now. Right now. Right now. Infinite spirit ever flowing ever within me ever flowing infinite wisdom ever shows the way there is just one love that love is god's love that love is perfect that love is my love now, right now. There is just one heart. That heart is God's heart. That heart is perfect. That heart is my heart now, right now. flowing ever within me ever growing infinite wisdom ever shows the way there is just one mind that mind is God's mind that mind is perfect that mind is my mind now, right now, there is just one life, that life is God's life, that life is perfect, that life is my life now, right now, right now.
ever grow is infinite wisdom ever shows the way there is just infinite spirit ever flow is ever within me ever grow is infinite wisdom ever shows the way Once upon a time, there was a thought, and the thought was active and had life and energy. The thought affected the thinker, the thinker's community, and the space in the realm. The thinker went through cycles, sometimes directing energy to the thought and sometimes allowing the thought to languish. Eventually, the thinker took action and something tangible was created, and the thinker experienced a manifestation. After a while, the thinker moved on and turned attention away from the thought. When the thinker released attachment, the thought became passive. The thought was then balanced and therefore complete, and the thought dissolved. The end. <laughs> That's the life story of a thought. So that's how a thought, how, how an idea becomes an experience, and then how a thought can become balanced and therefore complete, and how thoughts disappear. So here's some examples. Maybe you have a project that you're going to do, and you have this project around the house. Maybe you're going to refinish furniture, or make a quilt, or who knows, write something, or some activity that you want to do. So you collect supplies and you keep those supplies in your house. And you probably have that, that table for your hobbies or that closet, that shelf, that drawer that where you're keeping those things you're going to get around to one day. For me, it's uh, I, just one of the many projects. There's a, I bought a little mobile at an art fair. It's a bird. It's made out of wood. And when you pull the string, the wings flap. Well, it broke. So I put it in the drawer. And it's been there now probably more years than I want to say. <laughs> but I'm going to get around to it one day. <laughs> because I'm, I like it. I'm attached to it. I want to fix it. So when, you know, sometimes I think about that or other projects and I'm giving energy to it. I'm attached to it. I'm not ready to release that yet. And then again, sometimes I'm just letting that languish, just letting it take up space. So as long as, you know, I'm attached to this idea, then I, I keep this item, these supplies, and then if I ever become unattached, you know, just admit that this is not something I need, I can release it and then make space for what's new, something new in life. I also do this with books because I love to read, and I, so I order lots of books, and then I pile them up in different shelves and cabinets in different places around the house, and I'm, I'm attached to them because I am going to get around to reading those books one day. But when I do feel complete with a particular book, then I can release it. I'm ready to let it go to someone else. And I like to put them in those tiny houses, those little tiny houses for books. There's a couple of them in my neighborhood where people buy those libraries, and then they get all full of stuff. They get piled up until people are ready to release from there. So active thoughts have energy. They're alive. We can think of active thoughts as living beings. And we create our experience by focusing our thoughts. And Unity's third principle states it this way. We are co-creators with God, creating reality through thoughts held in mind. We are co-creators with God, creating reality through thoughts held in mind. Our spiritual community, on our website, unityhouston.org, we say it this way, we create our life experiences through our consciousness or way of thinking, which includes the dominant thoughts, ideas, beliefs, opinions, and perspectives we have about life. 
When we focus on something, we direct energy towards it, and that energy affects the space that we inhabit. And this is why so much of self personal growth, personal growth, self-help, why it focuses on changing our thoughts, changing the, the self-talk that we have in our minds. When we become aware of what we're thinking, a lot of times we become aware that we're thinking about fear, worry, lack, not enoughness, unworthiness. When we're feeding these types of limited thoughts, then that's when it feels appropriate to flee or to build defenses or to freeze. That's that fight or flight or freeze reaction that we have. And so again, this is why a lot of spiritual growth involves releasing negative patterns and creating new thought energy. Ernest Holmes said, change your thinking, change your life. Change your thinking, change your life. Now, if we could see our thoughts as actual living beings, then we might pay more attention to what we're thinking. Like, can you imagine if our thoughts went out like fireflies. Like what if there was darkness and we could see our thoughts as little bright sparkly lights? Or what if our thoughts emerged as gnats or mosquitoes and were swarming? So if we could actually see what we were sending out, we could see, you know, some of our thoughts are like snails, like slow and just kind of plodding along, not getting anywhere very fast. And you know, sometimes our thoughts are like dragonflies and they're swooping and soaring and changing directions really quickly. When I was on my spiritual journey kind of years ago, starting out, I would have this question, if God is good all the time, then why are there fire ants? Why are there poisonous snakes? Why are there leeches? If God is good all the time, then why allow into the creation things that are deadly or that spread diseases. So it makes sense to me to look at animals as symbolic of different types of thought. There are many different ways of being in this world, and there are many different ways of manifesting thought. Now, I like uh, videos of animals doing cute and funny things. There's one I saw recently of this great big panda bear and for some unknown reason, it just started rolling down this gentle incline. It was just rolling, just, it was so cute. Some animals are so cute and cuddly, and some are really not. And, <laughs> but so I think it's interesting to explore how different types of animals are symbolic of various forms of, of thought. Like another thing that puzzles me, birds that can't fly. Like why have wings if you're just gonna stand around, you know? But there are thoughts that are like that. Maybe a really great thought, but we never let it soar. So it just is pedestrian on the ground. There are animals that are stealthy and playful and gentle and swarming. And if we could see our thoughts tangibly in this world, we might ask ourselves, what are we letting out? So thoughts are living beings on the individual level and on the collective level, on the group level. There are thoughts that have energy within families, within organizations, within societies. Author Harold W. Percival puts it this way, thinking is the basic factor in shaping human destiny. Thinking is the basic factor shaping human destiny, both individually and collectively. We solve problems by thinking. We make progress by thinking. And humanity has solved a lot of problems. Did you know that chewing food takes a lot of energy? I learned this recently. Some animals spend over half of their waking hours just chewing enough food to survive. <laughs> so what did humans do? We learned how to cook. When we don't have to spend a lot of energy foraging and chewing and digesting food, then we have time for things like creating art and telling stories and exploring math problems, if you're into that. <laughs> Thinking drives our reality. And when we have thoughts in common with other people, we form groups. Groups band together. They come together and they stay together because people in those groups are sharing common thoughts with each other. And we say things like, we're on the same wavelength. 
Thoughts emerge from individuals. They meld together from different individuals. And when they're melded together, there's more energy. There's more life force involved in those thoughts. There's momentum. And the energy affects the space of operation. So this is why people attend rallies and marches. Energy emerges from that collective focus, from that collective energy of being together, and that life force is sustained even after the event is over. This is why we go to concerts, why we go to sporting events, why we go to musicals, because we're sharing an experience together. We're focusing our thoughts and our energy. And we know that strong personalities can exert a lot of energy into thoughts, both constructively and destructively. Some thoughts are designed to be contagious. And we get to decide where we want to focus and contribute energy and where we don't. So the life cycle of a thought. When we stop paying attention to a thought, when we stop nurturing it, then that thought is no longer active and it begins to fade away. When we stop feeding a thought, it becomes passive. And when we, we release attachment to it, then it's free to dissolve. And therapy and counseling and coaching work when the guide empowers us to allow solutions and insights to emerge from within our own being. And these types of things are much less effective when they have us just retelling the same story over and over and supporting us in telling that story. We can keep a conversation going for an entire lifetime. For generations, we can pass on those conversations to many generations. So when a thought is active, that means we're attached to it. And by maintaining attachment, we keep that thought active. This is a principle of life in the universe. What we nurture lasts longer than what we ignore. That's why if we want to keep plants alive, we give them some water, for example. So we complete a thought by bringing it into balance so that it's no longer active. Passive thoughts are balanced. They're neutral. They're not tipping the scale one way or the other. When a thought is balanced, we return to harmony about that topic. We're neither triggered by it nor charged up by it. We say things like, it is what it is. So when we're clinging to an idea of how something should be or what it should be, then we're, you know, we're attached to that. But if we're working toward that non-attachment, then we're releasing these, this need to control. And it can take quite a bit of exploration and processing and spiritual practice to release a thought. Some thoughts are very deeply entrenched. The spiritual pathway is not always easy. It's not, it's not, I was going to say it's not for sissies. Is that okay to say that? <laughs> I mean, sure, sometimes on the spiritual journey we're floating on clouds and we're existing in bliss. And then sometimes we're bringing in some heavy-duty tools to break up some serious obstacles. You know, there might be times where you feel like you need a hard hat and some steel-toed boots to endure the falling rocks. Or you might need the spiritual equivalent of a pry bar to get loose these thoughts that are deeply lodged. So on your spiritual path, what are you releasing? Where in your life are you seeking freedom? What thoughts are heavy or tedious or draining? What are you ready to release? And then on the other hand, what thoughts do you want to nurture with more care and feeding? This life cycle of a thought works for both these thoughts that are life-giving, life-affirming, life-sustaining, that nurture and support well-being, and for thoughts that are destructive. There are some powerful active thoughts that we don't want to release. We want to hold on to those. We want to nurture them with care and feeding. We want to help them grow. And maybe sometimes you just want to have some fun thoughts, like that panda bear rolling down the incline, just playful, enjoying life. And at the group level, what are thoughts that are active that would be effective for us to complete as a family, as an organization, 
as a community, as a society? Where are we experiencing incompletion about our history? What conversations do we need to complete so that we can experience more well-being? So I contribute to group thought with my individual thoughts so I can ask myself, what energy and momentum am I feeding? Where can I change my thinking? Where can I release my attachment? Where can I come into more balance and harmony so that any negativity that I might be harboring can dissolve and disappear? And I think the first step is acknowledging and talking about it, naming it, bringing the, what's in the dark out into the light. So instead of blaming each other and cranking up fear, we can focus on removing obstacles in our own hearts and minds. Balancing thoughts happens first at the individual level. So it's up to each one of us to bring more harmony into this human experience. And this is what we do as a spiritual community. This is why we exist as a spiritual community. We focus on thoughts about thriving, nurturing, forgiving, transforming. And we practice our spiritual tools and we deepen our practices. And this helps us be more effective human beings. We ask questions and we explore and we go deep. And then sometimes we do just play and laugh and have fun and dance and sing. Because that's important too for bonding. There's certainly been times in my life when I've been confused or frustrated or feeling lost, feeling troubled or stuck or not seeing possibilities in my life. And then in those times, it would feel like I was walking around in a dark cloud and like wherever I went, this dark cloud went with me. And the process was to unravel these tangled thoughts and to examine them, and sometimes to find their source, to find their origin, so I can let them go. It's a process of letting the light in and seeing possibilities, returning to peace and balance and harmony. Now, I do like to pay attention to current events. I feel like history's in the making. I kind of like to just see what momentum is happening in the world, just observe the different energies that are happening in the world, and there's a lot of division. You may have noticed there's quite a, a lot of division. And it seems like there are some people who want to complete certain conversations and let those conversations dissolve. And then there's other people that really want to keep those thoughts active and alive. And from every angle, there's a lot of conversations that we need to be afraid. And we see this with many things. I saw it with the pandemic. There's people who are saying, we're not taking it seriously enough. There's people saying, we're overreacting. But they're coming from this approach that we gotta, we've got to be afraid. The other day, I was talking to a friend, and I told her, next pandemic, I hope we handle it a lot differently. And she was like, let's hope there is no next pandemic. Let's not, she didn't want to be here for that. We're facing challenges as a society and as a world. And this is what I want to hear from leaders and politicians and influencers and people in the public sphere. We are problem-solving beings. We have access to insight and inspiration. We have overcome many challenges and difficulties. So let's put our hearts and minds together and focus on thoughts that are thriving and that nurture life. We have many options and possibilities. We can stir up momentum for progress. Let's focus on effective ideas that lead to resolution. We can do this. We've done it many times before. Let's focus attention on well-being and take inspired action. And one way we can do this is with awareness of the, the life cycle of a thought. Thank you. I'm so happy to be here tonight with Stacy and David. Usually we're up to a lot of mischief, so we've been, we've been very good tonight. Well, what makes you think it's going to be any different? There's still time. I'm just glad, no, there's no mosquitoes or fireflies flying out of my head right now, I hope. I love that uh, image of the 
animals and creatures and, and, and comparing that to our thoughts as a metaphor for our thoughts. And I was just thinking about how there are definitely ones I recognize, like shark type thoughts, they're pretty obvious, right? But sometimes those mosquitoes, you think you've got one, and then here come, <laughs> you know, 10,000 more. So in your spiritual practice, how do you kind of recognize those and, and, and let them complete with grace and then create perhaps a new thought, offer something else in place of that? The annoying thoughts? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the ones that keep us from being our highest and best, perhaps, with others, yeah. Yeah. Well, to me, it is uh, that unraveling that I talked about. There's so many different tools of figuring out the origin of the thought, like what is that, what, did, what am I believing about myself that I could let go? And what am I believing about other people that I can let go? And you know, it's just, people are a mirror for what's going on in me, so I have to take responsibility for, you know, working out my annoyance, frustration, anger, all of that, while I'm projecting it out there. You know, it's, of course it starts in here. Mm -hmm. And I'm not opposed to swatting a few mosquitoes down <laughs> <out> there. Uh, <laughs> right. right. You, uh, um, I, appreciated, I appreciated everything you said, actually. That was outstanding. Mm. Um, and I have translated thoughts as prayers. I believe that all thoughts, all words are prayers. Mm -hmm. And um, I also believe that if you wonder what you've been praying for, look at what you have. Mm -hmm. And um, that empowers me much of the time to stay response-able. Uh, if not actually at cause with my circumstances, I always remain responsible, you know, able to, to um, engage with my circumstance. Um, there's something about, that you said about uh, you were quoting... Um, no, one of our spiritual leaders. Um, uh, was it Charles Fillmore or Ernest Holmes? Ernest Holmes. Change your thinking, change your life. Mm -hmm. And so thoughts held in mind produce in kind. Mm -hmm. um, and so we, we practice certain thought patterns and it manifests mm -hmm. and that's all great, except when it's not. Mm -hmm. And I, I was finding myself thinking not only on the individual level, but especially on the macro level, if you're displeased with anything, you're displeased with the outcomes that, are, that you're producing or your circumstance mm -hmm. or your own emotional response to a circumstance, there's something that's being invalidated by your own thoughts, then recognizing, okay, I, I'm authoring my experience of this. Uh, I would just like you to talk a little bit more about, I, as basically it's a version of the question that Stacy asked you, and that is, is how do we grow into our next highest best selves? You know, it's, it seems simplistic to just say, okay, I'm going to think a different thought now. Yeah. Clarity. I love the word clarity. Clarity is joy. Joy is clarity to me. But the only way I can get there is by getting rid of the garbage, right? Releasing um, the junk. So I really try to feel like and, and do and practice whatever helps me be more clear, more um, available for, you know, to be a conduit of that love and light and joy to come into the world. Because, you know, you can think of it as friction. If there's obstacles in the way, the light's going to get diverted or mm. obstructed. Um, so release <laughs> is always the, the first step, I think. Mm. And, you know, in Unity, they, they, they talk about denials, which uh, maybe didn't age very well as a term, but um, denying what is untrue eternally releasing all that then we can start to build back i think mm -hmm. it's like remodeling a house you take out the take out the old stuff before you yeah. start putting in the new you know the other piece that i really um, appreciate about the kind of creatures out there or, or the thoughts being a uh, being themselves is that it really helps us, uh, helped me to, okay, we disidentify with our thoughts. We are not our thoughts. They are their own things. Yes, we feed them, and that's how they keep going, right? But just because I'm having a thought doesn't make it true, right? They're, <laughs> I had to learn that the hard way. I was still learning that. But really, we don't have to buy into every thought 
that comes into our mind. Yeah. And, you know, especially those ones that come in with some hot energy about somebody needs to do something differently. Wait a minute. You know, let me investigate that mosquito for a minute and see where that's coming from, right? It's not, it's where, where, where is it arising from? And I, I like what you said about denials too, because if we're not denying what is existing, it may very well be that I am frustrated in this moment. It's just that this frustration has no power in the absolute realm, right? I can sit back and lean back from it a little bit and then from that place, perhaps choose a different thought. Yes. Exactly. And I'm glad you brought up about the prayer, too, because that's why I feel like it's important for us to come together in meditation, to come together in prayer and in song, and because we are stirring up that energy. And, mm -hmm. and then, like you're saying, that's what we teach in meditation, right? That thoughts are going to come, they're going to pass like clouds in the sky, and we just don't have to latch on to them. We can just observe them. Okay, thought, I see you. <laughs> you can go. <laughs> and just let it be. I had one more thought I, I thought relevant to share, and that is when you were speaking about the collective consciousness is uh, also has thoughts that are inherent in our time. I, you, you use society and our institutions, and I'm going to use the word time because I think we are definitely a product of all that has preceded us, and here we are. And there are certain customs that we exercise right now, and we stand on them with kind of a religious fortitude that's not at all inherent, you know, that we've inherited them and we've kind of made them our own. And it caused me to think, okay, what, what will humanity be like in a thousand years? I mean, not even a few hundred years, because you know what, the music, I'm, I'm, I'm enough of a music historian that I actually have a 600 year perspective about music. I know what was happening in music 600 years ago and how it has evolved to what we have now. So I can think in those units based on the past, but a thousand years, whew. But if I think forward a thousand years, we're, it's gonna be really different. I, I mean, I have to believe that most of the things that we find dramatic and significant and, and annoying right now will fade in significance just as you know, we aren't living the world of our Viking families, and you know, we we actually have different methods of doing of solving our problems. Um, and sometimes, when I'm thinking in that way, and I'm wondering, well, what is mine to do? It very often, um, it, occasionally, it'll show up as something very specific I can do. I can contribute here. I can serve here. I can do this action. But more often than not, it's, it's, it's like, well, what am I thinking? Where are my thoughts in this moment that are consistent with a civilization that is healthy and thriving in a thousand years? Mm -hmm. um, and, and I find comfort in that. It, it quiets me down a little bit, gets me clearer, gets me a bit more focused. Yeah, yeah we're, we're doing something by thinking, right? We are, <laughs> we're taking action. Thought is an action. So... Yeah, let's just hope that there's this momentum will build when we're part of this. We know this community is part of creating this atmosphere, this environment of nurturing and well-being because there is a lot of noise out there. And, uh, you know, I considered going into talking about guns and violence and mm. slavery yeah. and all of that because we have all this, these built-up conversations that are perpetuated. And... What is it going to take to complete those conversations, you know, and just mm -hmm. be able to release some of this, that, these ideas that we're carrying around? And a lot of it's fear I, I'm going to hold it that this is what it looks like, that this is what release looks like mm. in its messiness, in mm -hmm. its unfortunate condition. This is what it looks like on the way out. And, then, and again, what, what's mine to do? Yeah, I was just reading this morning uh, Michael Singer's new book, uh, in Liv Living Untethered, and he talks about the fact, kind of, David, remind me of what you were just saying about the thousand-year view and what's yours to do now. Can you live your life in a way that would support how you want the world to be? And he talked about really doing an evaluation. Is the peace, joy, and compassion that you exude and experience in your own mind and in your life, if everyone had that same one, what would the world look like? So what am I contributing, you know, to that? 
And because that's where it all starts, right? And to, then I think from that place, we can start to question some of these inherited beliefs, these collected, like these things that we've all just kind of taken for granted and we can be able to start dismantling. Yes, amen. <laughs> Let's do that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I just invite us in the spirit of our collective consciousness to turn within once again this evening. And let's just take a nice deep breath together, focusing our attention inward. And in this moment, we know ourselves as whole, perfect, and complete. Each one of us is self-expression of the divine, completely fulfilled. And so we take this opportunity to extend the divine love that we are to others in our world. You may call to mind any individuals that you wish to lift up in prayer for healing, love, support, or that they may know their own wholeness, or it may be some conditions that you see in the world that you would just like to hold in that space of wholeness, perfectness, completeness. And so we just take a moment now and just feel free to speak the names of the people that you would like to hold in prayer at this time. And so as we direct our consciousness to these beautiful beings, we behold them in their wholeness, knowing that they are already expressions of the divine. They have everything within them they need to experience full healing in every area of their life. And so we know what it is done. And we give thanks for being a part of this spiritual community in which we can come together and join our thoughts of healing our thoughts of love, our thoughts of compassion for the world, for our own inner worlds and the world beyond these walls. We hold that highest vision. And so it's with gratitude for this opportunity to express the light of the divine in the world. We say thank you, and so it is. Amen. Amen. And now we join together in our meta practice, a prayer for the welfare of all beings. By the, By the power, power of this practice, may all, all beings have happiness and the causes of happiness. May all beings be free from suffering and the causes of suffering. May they, may they know the sacred joy that arises in the space beyond suffering. May they rest in equanimity that knows no grasping or hatred. May they experience the equality of all beings. May my practice be of benefit to all. Namaste, namaste, I bow to you. Namaste, namaste. Shine your light into the world. 